Hello everybody. Today's video is going to be something a little bit different as I have a conversation with my good friend Jeremy Carice around the whole question of racism. What is racism? What is systemic racism? What does it look like, um, especially in our South African context? And how is it different from many of the messages we are receiving from the American context? And how do we understand these messages and apply them and correctly think about racism in our own context? This is a big question I have, and I'm going to be posing some of those questions to Jeremy in this in this video and in this discussion. Um, Jeremy um, and I have known each other since our days together in seminary. Um, he's married to Tanya, and he wears a number of um, hats. He's a father of four. Um, alongside um, Tanya, he's also the, um, what, are they, what would you call them? They are the owners and founders of Exilic Music, which is a recording studio um, here in um, the Fishuk area. And Jeremy is also the um, South African leader of J-Life um, Ministries, a discipleship ministry in South Africa and elsewhere in the world. And on top of that, they also, Tanya and Jeremy, together lead a church in their home. So a number of hats that he wears, but Jeremy has always been someone that I've um, just drawn to um, in terms of speaking about difficult things and um, difficult concepts difficult struggles within the church and he's um, often had his finger on the pulse in terms of many of these things and so i asked him to have this conversation with me uh, i want to apologize for the, the bit of the quality of the video the audio is okay but our signal um, our internet connection wasn't that great over zoom and so some of the video isn't great but you will get um, the gist of it just from the audio itself where the video breaks up a bit so apologies for that this is the first of a a multi-part series where we will continue the discussion you'll hear in our conversation that we actually say that we need to actually have this conversation further and we will be doing that soon and you'll be receiving those um, both on um, YouTube and on our podcast so enjoy I've been really wrestling with you know what's happening in the world obviously besides COVID COVID's like old news now um, you know <laughs> almost in the world um, and obviously we, we get everything that comes from America. We get it, whether we want to get it or not, we get it. And the world has to, the world has to bow to whatever America's flavor of the week is. So all over the world, everyone does what is being done in America, which is a whole nother question on its own. But in South Africa, we have our own very real struggles that I think yeah. are, I think are more important to us. I'm not saying what's happening in America is not important. It's, it's very important. But like our struggles are are, 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 are are probably bigger struggles, really. I don't know. You can't say one's bigger than the other, but but they are really real. There's, it's still very real stuff that's happening in our own society. And um, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of understand how do we navigate this um, in terms of the whole Black Lives Matter and um, George Floyd. And, and then you have the, the situation in South Africa where you know, I just, I, my comparison to that is if you think of the Marikana massacre, th there's, if the, if the level of outrage to that should be so much greater, even if you think of the level of, um, yeah, human life and injustice and corruption, you know, that, that plays into that. And so I'm trying to wrestle through this. And then I've just seen a lot of people, um, on social media with interesting views and, and opinions about that. And, I saw one by um, Stephen Murray, which I mentioned to you, which I didn't engage with, but the, his thoughts were really um, good thoughts. We were saying, you know, where do Christians land? Because he's seeing a lot of right, what, what he would de determine to be right wing. And then what he would, I mean, he just used that language, right wing or left wing responses from right. Christians. And, right. you know, how do we engage with this stuff without going towards a left wing or a right wing? And sometimes even those responses are also coming to us from the media from america so they're not even necessarily um voices that are south african yeah. you know they 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 other voices yes because what's like exactly i had this conversation sorry to, to jump no, no, in. i had this jump conversation in. with a friend a couple of years ago i think it was around the time of trump's first election uh, or the like the last u.s election and um we we were talking about like left wing and right wing and and like what does that even mean in south africa you know like who's truly left and who's truly right here i mean it's easy to go you know far right in terms of mm. your 
like your old conservative party or whatever. But like a lot of that kind of language doesn't even translate so simply into the South African political context. Yeah. But as I say, we are so heavily influenced in our ideology and our theology when it comes to um, whatever's happening in, in uh, the West and I guess America in particular. Yeah. So no, 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 jump stop. in whenever you need to jump in. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't even know really in terms of even thinking through um, chatting about this. I don't even know what is the conversation to have. I just know that I'm confused by the conversations I'm seeing people having. That, that's where I find myself as a Christian. I'm confused by a lot of the conversations. Um, you, you know, we, before we spoke about this, you mentioned that um, podcast by, um, now I'm going to get the name wrong. Um, uh, Pickering, Jordan yeah, Pickering. What's the name of the podcast itself? Ons Mensa. What? Oh, uh, it's called Yellow Mensa. Yellow Mensa. Yellow Mensa. So with Jordan Pickering and with, I think it was um, John Skippers and I, I'm not sure I know the other gentleman. David, David Kluter. David, David Kluter. Kluter. Oh, is he also part of Isi Bambano? Yes, yes, yes. The two of them lead Isi Bambano. Okay. Okay. So um, that was very insightful. It was actually, that was recorded a while ago though. But it's it's really fitting yeah, for last, yeah, it's last year, yeah. yeah. So that conversation, it's episode nineteen. So if anyone wants to go and watch that, if if you know people watch this, um, but that was very insightful because I think it painted it in that it is exactly what we're talking about. It's the fact that we're getting all this stuff from America, which is coming from a particular context. Then we have to contextualize that stuff coming into our context, and we have to deal with the realities of our own context, which is so different. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I was I, I trying to avoid these sorts of conversations on Facebook, but I do sometimes get into them. And our dear friend that was at college with us, Mr. Benjamin Pedro, um, he, po- oh, I don't know if you okay. saw this. I'm not, on, I'm not on social media. So I, so, <laughs> either I'm missing out big time or I'm doing just fine. One of no, no, no. Are- stay, stay off. Just stay away. <laughs> stay away from it. He, he put up a very provocative post saying black people can be racist. And um, there was obviously massive back and forth from different people who I don't know because sure. it's mainly his, his network of people. Sure, and sure, sure. So, but I engaged with someone on that and I was saying, um, I think my question was, is there a difference between racism as a, as a, as a principal idea of believing you're, you're, believing you're better than another race? And is that even the definition? Is it believing you better or is it disliking someone for their race? I'm I'm not sure which one it is. And then besides that question itself, is there then a difference between that basic racism as a, as a concept and systemic racism, you know, which, which is a, is a system. And then one of the people, and we were talking about that and someone chimed in and said, yeah, but black people can't be racist. And there's because black people have never um, oppressed anybody. Now that's a question that's open-ended. I mean, I don't know history wise of the history of the world, but, but I asked, I said, well, what if, you know, racism itself is a construct, you know, socially, I mean, who, how do we decide I'm a white person and you're a brown person? You know, who's, who's determines that? Um, and so I said, well, what if we, we look at tribalism in Africa? Um, you know, there's some, been some pretty big tribal battles in Africa. The, obviously the Hutus and the Tutsis is the biggest one that we can think of. But so the conversation in that way, I was trying to think of it in terms of our context in Africa, South Africa, what, what, where we at. And then the other side of it is our biggest power struggles, um, seem to be, I think it gets framed often still in the framework of racism um, and there's a reality to that. But I think the biggest power struggles is, is seems to me to be more about those who have and those who do not have. Um, and, and the injustice that if you've in a certain class, you get a certain level of justice. And if you're in another class, you get a different level of justice. So yeah, those are all yeah. just thoughts that are, you know, rumbling through my yeah. brain and trying to understand the yeah. stuff. So, yeah. Now you, and now I, th- I, know what now you I want throw to... the ball at you <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I ask you to solve the world's problems. Thank you, Jeremy. We're waiting uh, for you. 
you gotta ask you this, this colored dude, a middle aged colored dude from Ocean View, to solve the world's problem. From Ocean okay, View, cool. living in Fishuk, though. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Living in the heart of. Oh. <laughs> In the heart of this call is recorded for quality purposes. Yes, yes. Let me just... Oh, man. Um, so I've just thrown out a whole bunch of say. ideas. I, that's all I did is I threw a whole bunch of ideas at you in the hope uh, that you can yeah. guide me in this. Sure. Yeah. I, I think you, 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 you raise... So let me, let me say this. I, I think you are raising issues and questions and you are recognizing um you you are recognizing things that a lot of people don't irrespective of where you land on it even just the fact that you are and 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 i'm not colorblind so you are a, a white south african hey okay. hey uh, it's just winter <laughs> okay so, <laughs> so, so the fact so even the fact that you as a and you you talk in context so even the fact that you as a white and i'm not pandering to you yeah i'm just pulling it for what it is the fact that you as a white South african um of africa afrikaans descent if i can add that the fact that you are able to recognize like nuances between individualistic uh, prejudice and racism and the possibilities of something bigger, something more societal, something more, the word you use was systemic. I think that's, that's very um, encouraging for me as a person of color because more often than not, and and this happened even today, like even this mm. afternoon mm. in, in a, a, a training session I was doing. More often than not, white South Africans, let's just keep it contextual, can't see those nuances, can't see those distinctions and uh, let alone engage in them. Um, mm. So, so uh, this for me is encouraging. Um, just, so how would, know, just, how uh, would you, just, so say I, I, I am completely ignorant of this. How would you describe that difference? Um, you know, and that nuance yeah. of, of let's just talk about racism. And again, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm still, conf I'm still confused in myself about is racism just, sure. you know, so dis I, disliking someone I, for I, their I, race or is it thinking that you better? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then sure. the reality so I, that I, there's, I, yeah. No, 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 go ahead. No, no, just the, that reality that there's that there can be racism as a principle existent in society yeah. or in individuals or people, and yeah, yeah, not exclusive or not necessarily related or not you know there can also be a system which is particularly prejudiced yeah, or yeah, racist yeah. towards yeah. a particular group of people, and that doesn't have to be a yeah. political system. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had this conversation today. Um, I was actually talking to, um, to, I think I was talking to my daughter about this. But I used this example in an, oh, I've had lots of conversations today. <laughs> <laughs> I used this, this example in a conversation with one of the brothers in our church who was, who was uh, interestingly, is, um, he's an asylum seeker. From, he's from the DRC originally, sure. but he lives here in my school. Uh, and so we were talking about injustice and his heart was just particularly burdened. And we were just wrestling through the scriptures and our everyday realities. But I, I made this example in conversation with him. And then again, in conversation with my daughter, I said, we, we talk a lot about racism and I share your sentiment. It's not just the kind of prejudicial racism that's, classes i don't like you because of your race and race is just like externals right race mm. is i always delineate race from ethnicity and ethnicity from culture because yeah. but race uh, is only physical, just physical features but now i think for it's, a lot of people they wouldn't necessarily distinguish that they they would just sure, they would sure. put it all together as as, as you're sure, this sure. person or yeah 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 and, and there's obviously the overlap and, and that's just the complexity of life. But if you want to talk, if you want to talk ethnicity, ethnicity, I mean, you see it all over the, the pages of scripture. Ethnicity is your ancestry. It's your bloodline, mm. right? It's where it's, 
It's who you are related to by virtue of blood. Hmm. Okay? So I am of mixed ethnicity. My ancestry is complicated. <laughs> okay? So there's a mix of probably a, a, a lot of indigenous, uh, the, the indigenous who dwelt here um, for centuries, the Khoisan people, and then um, a mix of that and the slaves who were brought here by the, by, the, by the Dutch colonists and subsequently by the British colonists and the colonists themselves, the colonizers themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my ethnicity. I'm sorry, I can't give you a whole lot more at this stage. I'm still on the You haven't journey. done a test. <laughs> no, I haven't. But then culture is different because culture is what people create. I think yeah. it's part of the cultural mandate when God says, uh, Genesis 1, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. A lot of that has like geographical connotations because where you go, mm. that's where you settle. And where you settle, you kind of, it's what you make of your world, right? So if you settle near the ocean, you're probably going to be a seafaring people. You're probably going to be a seafood eating people. It affects the way you dress. It, it affects the way you relate to your environment and then also the way you relate to one another, right? And then you form this whole way of life that we might want to call society. But in culture, there's also things like your value system, your worldview, mm -hmm. the way you look at the world. Of course, there's language. And like I said, you know, things like how you eat, lifestyle stuff. That's kind of, now that doesn't have to be restricted to uh, to your ethnicity. It just depends yeah. on who's in that who's in that society, who's in that social circle, who's in that community. You form culture, you know. Which is why I believe a lot of people say, "Ah, oh, don't call yourself a colored because that was a racial construct. That's an epithet. The apartheid government mm. put that on you. Don't take it for yourself." I'm going, nah. I'm not taking that. I'm all about the culture because we've got a unique culture that mm. we've created. It's distinct. There may be overlap with other cultures, but this is very distinct. The people create the culture. But then race is something very, very different and mm. something very superficial. I mean, it's literally just physical features. Yeah. Your race is... The tone of your skin, the texture of your hair, the size of your nose is what you look like. Which is why apartheid in South Africa was so crazy. Because what do you do racially with people of mixed ancestry? Like, they, they're not monolithic. They all look yeah, so different. Exactly. You know? and, and that's where, for like me, would, like the question, you know, with the whole, where I was saying, well, what about tribalism that's happened? You know, there's been many tribalistic conflicts in Africa, yeah. for example. And I, I mean, I don't know, actually, I would, I, I'm not a, a fair with the history, but how did the Hutus and the Tutsis, for example, tell each other apart in the way that... Oh, they, no, so they're they all so they they, big time. There's physical features. Physical there. features. So even though the yeah, color of yeah, their I skin think. was probably quite similar, there was definite yeah. physical... Yeah. So that's also racialism, even though you would, according to the construct of race, which is, again, like we say, it's a, it's a, a man-made idea they would be put but, in the same but yes, racial but, group, but they saw each yeah, other as yes, being... Yeah. For sure, but, but here's where it gets tricky with race. Because, and, and I like the, the word, you, I mean, you've used it a few times now, the social construct. Race has an idea of a social construct. I, I would agree with that. And I've wrestled with this and I continue to. But I, I do believe and I agree that race is a social construct. But when you tell origins of that that idea of racism as we know it today as a social construct the origins of that idea that construction is always rooted in firstly one group dominating over another group hmm. and and essentially the group dominating over the other group then seeing themselves as superior right hmm. but you also can't disconnect that idea of race as a social construct from scientific racism, which you really, if you if you if you're gonna be honest, you're gonna have to track it back to like Darwinism mm. and like the origins of you know the evolution of the species. You're gonna go go back to 
to like your light rationalism kind of that, you know, and, and then you're going to find all these things begin to manifest. And so essentially it's then a Western ideology that comes out of rationalism and that mm. whole mm. year. So you have scientific racism now. Yeah. And that's also what a lot of the, the forefathers and the architects of apartheid studied. That concept, that scientific racism, that is a social construct that actually puts white people as supreme over yeah. other races. So, so now it becomes virtually impossible to apply that. People who look the same. But yeah. have Sorry, just repeat that. Just repeat that because it's your last sentence. To apply that. You, you uh, lost. It becomes very difficult to apply that concept to people in other regions, people who look the same, but who have, you know, they might have the same general skin color, but they are, you know, power dynamics at play. Yeah. For example, so that's, I think what you, yeah. you couldn't, you, you can't put that in the same category because scientific racism, which is really the origin of racism as we know it, has more of a, a Western European kind of origin. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And I think it's very helpful because um, we, we're speaking about, in a sense, we're speaking about different things that they can look similar because, and I want to yeah, get to yeah. this question is what's actually at the root of racism because racism is, is a serious problem. And whether we look at it, you know, like we said, as a system or, or just racism is a serious problem, but there is something that's deeper than that. That's not the deepest, you know, if we look at the human condition and the human heart, there's something that sits underneath that. So, I mean, what spoiler alert? You want, like, what, well, I mean, what? sin. People don't love God. Sin. They, yeah, so I there like, we go. But I mean, we can yeah. come back to that question, but I think what, what you're doing, which is helpful is, is saying that there are ways in which people in societies and in general can mistreat or yeah. or, or hate or, yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whatever they can they can choose someone a group of people to be their enemy and that can be a reality but that yeah. does not necessarily the same reality as what you're saying as a system which was set up through um let's say for example um i mean the jury might be out, but let's say through um, Darwinian evolution set up as this idea, this construct of one race is superior. These are the races and this race is superior. Someone's at the top. Hey, it's, a, it's an extension of survival of the fittest. Is it yeah. natural selection? Is it intelligent design? Survival yeah. of the fittest. Some races are superior. You know, fast track that and you end up with Arianism or you yes. end up with, it's It's really rooted in that. And I didn't always see that. So I often would argue and say, no, of course, we can all be racist. If we hate other races, then we are racist. But I, I've kind of begun to move away from that position when I began to understand the origins of what we today have as, you know, this, this, this yeah. concept of the social construct of racism. Yeah. Are there problems between other people groups? Yes, of course. But it's not, it doesn't have the same origin. So I think that's helpful because I think what people need to distinguish, which I think in this conversation, I think what's one of the big things with that is keeps tripping me up is um, that I think people are saying similar things, meaning different things and are missing each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. And especially as yeah. Christians as well, it's very, because we might, if we miss each other on this, then we start to, I think that was the part of that conversation in that podcast is we start to think, oh, you're a liberal or you're a conservative or we started to put each other in these camps and you're stuck in yeah, a camp yeah. um, based on this stuff and we, you can't have a conversation. Yeah, um, yeah, no, you can't. So so can, I think what can, we need can, to can understand... Go, uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, go. no, so, so I was... I kind of put myself on a tangent. So I, was, I started saying I had this conversation today and this is kind of in response to what you mentioned earlier that there's, there's racism... But you were saying, there's this feeling that there's something deeper. It's not just this like prejudicial racism. I don't like you because you don't look like me. There's also this inequality, particularly in our context, this, this inequality, this injustice. So I was saying, if it was pure, like if we defined racism purely on an individualistic level and we said, 
oh, I don't quite like you because you don't look like me. Look at your hair. Look at, you know, I think actually all the people who look like you should go and live in one part of our world. Okay. So let's say our world is South Africa. And then the law is all white people, you go and live over there. Black people, you live there. Colored people, you live somewhere else. Indian people, you live because we are a segregated society because we are racist. We like mixing the races. We want separate development. Uh, the apartheid government used the language of self same separate development. Each mm. person can be the best they can be if they are on their own. Okay. Mm. So let's say that's, that's like, that's what racism is. And that's the only way to define racism. Then that's not really that bad of a thing. If mm. we said, Hey, but the playing fields are leveled. So I'll be an engineer and you are white for sure. As long as you go to a white school, study engineering at the white university and go and do engineering in your white community. You mm. want to be a doctor, you black, you want to be a pilot, you Indian. Well, what do you want to be? You want to be the president, you colored. Yes. Go get the best education you can. The opportunities are there for you. Just stay segregated. Mm. But that's not, that's not the, that's not what happened here. So, so, so when we begin to think systemically, then we realize that connected to this idea of racism is this idea of power where mm. one group is dominant over the other, not just that they feel they better, but that they also then begin to have power in every aspect of society. Mm. So they have spiritual power, religious power. They get to define, you know, what God is saying. They have, economic power they have political power they get to say they get to and that's and that's the history of our country mm. it's not as simple as just saying i don't like you because you don't look like me that's racist that might be racism on an individual level but there's there's also a a more structural reality that comes with it that's what i wanted to say yeah no i think that's very very helpful i mean because i think um I think where we have to, you know, bring that clarity in is that there are many different ways in which people um, can discriminate against each other, hate each other, yeah. um, prejudice yeah. each other. And, and that is always evil. I think in the, I mean, I'm speaking yeah. from a yeah. Christian perspective, I think in a lot yeah. of a non-Christian perspective, yeah. Yeah. sorry, say, say that again. You just broke up there. No, I'm I'm with you. I'm saying it's sinful. It's yes. evil. All of those yeah. things. Discrimination, yeah. prejudice. Yeah. I mean, in the world, people might see some of that as ways to get ahead. You know, if you stepping on other people to get ahead, but from a Christian worldview, any way in which I disregard, um, dishonor, harm, think badly, speak badly against anybody, that's bad. That's sin. But so that's one thing. And I think that we've got to bank that and say, well, that's, that's sort of the, I think the very basic understanding of how we deal with yep. any human being, you know, and, and I think yep. that's also where you start speaking about issues of sexism or ageism, yep. which is yep. other issues entirely, but where we deal with people differently because of their age or because of their sex or whatever the case, yep. but then or the ability or, or the ability. Yeah. So, but then, so the issue that we actually speaking about is that besides that, put that to the side, that's a reality. There is other systems, or you can say maybe it's a singular system, but it's probably not a single system. There are other systems of racism that exists, which come from a particular point in history and from a design. There was an actual design of this. It wasn't, um, it's just not by fluke and it has influenced um, the way that the world has operated for a very long time so that that yeah. influence is still a reality in the world today. Yeah. And, and that's the issue that I think people are, are pushing against yeah. and are speaking against. And that's where something like black lives matter or, or these kinds of yeah. sentiments, they're coming from a position of saying, yes, yes, there's, you know, bad in the world, but we're specifically addressing this system um, that people and, are still seeing. The challenge with Here's the challenge with that whole thing. So, like two, two things. On the one level, 
all of the, the, the things you mentioned at the beginning, prejudice and hatred and uh, discrimination and all of those things, as they operate on an individual level, or even like from one family to another or one community to another, it's still pretty visible. Like you can see it. Mm. It's not hard to spot. But when you start talking about this other thing, this social construct, this social engineering, it's pretty much like this invisible force that just shapes society and, and it's really social engineering. It shapes the way, it designs the way a society functions and then the way the people live in that society. But you, like, you can't see it. You can't just put your finger on it. You can't also say, oh, you started this. You know, it's not that simple. You can't just say, oh, it's Hendrik for Wood. It's, it, it becomes quite invisible. And so on the, uh, for number one is my response would be, that makes it very, very hard to deal with because, because it's invisible, often we can't recognize it. And I'm not just, I don't just mean that people who benefit from a system of racism uh, can't see it. So like, in, like in, in no uncertain terms, in South Africa, people of privilege are white people and they have in various ways benefited from, from that system. Mm. But they are not the only people who can't see it. People who have been oppressed or people who, who grew up uh, less privileged, they also can't see it because mm. it's just, it is what it is. This is just life the way we know it. This is, this is our world. It's not like, oh, I see this. I feel the pain. I don't quite enjoy it. But you, and, and I mean, you know that there's racism going yeah. on and you know that, oh, these people don't like me. But you can't see the system. Uh, and yeah. so that's a, a huge challenge. But the other thing I just want to throw in here, uh, my good brother, even you just talking about, and from a Christian perspective now, or theological perspective, even just you talking about systemic system, you, I think you said structure, I don't know what leftist words you use. What left? Even I'm a, I'm just recognizing the reality of systemic injustice could get you branded as liberal, leftist, You've left the gospel, you've left the centrality of the gospel and the scriptures, and you've now embraced uh, either a, a liberalist kind of a position yeah. or, or a social gospel, just for using those for, terms, because those terms don't belong within the yeah. bounds of orthodox, evangelical, you know, whatever you want to call it. So, so think, yeah, I think that is also hard to talk about. I think that maybe, maybe like for, for a future conversation, because I think this would be good to have multiple conversations, but I think this is in my understanding is I think where as evangelical, I don't even like, I don't want to use the term evangelical because I don't actually like that term as, as biblical Christians, <laughs> as followers of yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think where we will probably find departure with the, the with all groups on this issue is in what we believe is the, pro the solution to the problem. What is the answer to the problem? I think is where our biggest departure yeah. point comes. So it's not that you can recognize yeah. that there is a reality and there's a problem. It's actually, how do we solve this problem is I think where as, as people who believe in Jesus, I know this, this sounds completely oversimplified and, and we don't have time to go into this, but Ultimately, we will say Jesus is the answer. Now, how you unpack that is is what's really yeah, yeah, important. Yeah. But that's, that's where, where we will. Focused. That's our point where we will go to is say, to the answer to this problem is ultimately Christ. But then, what that means is what obviously we need to unpack, which which maybe we can do in another yeah. um, conversation. Yeah. But I think the, the that's one of the things as well that I struggle with, and it, it it was raised for me with with the point that Stephen Murray made in his Facebook post. Um, where he's saying there's these voices, there's these left-wing and right-wing voices, which a lot of them come from America. I, I've noticed a few in South Africa as well. I think the most challenging voices are, so this is, I've seen in America, there are black voices in America who are saying there is no such thing as systemic racism. It's a lie. It's not true. Now, and then they, they, then they tell their experience of the fact that they, and they've, they're usually very successful people and they've been, been able to make themselves very successful and they, you know, they have many 
good white and black and whatever friend and they and and they are uh, advocating for I know, I know for who you're talking about I know exactly. look there's a, there's a number of them and actually some of them some of them actually have some very good things to say some of them uh, you know yeah, 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 yeah. there's some valuable things but but so yeah. uh, how I'm hearing them the, the thing that I'm hearing them saying which is kind of and and now I need you to correct me if I'm wrong here because it's kind of similar to what actually you saying and even the experience you had where you saying you want to call yourself colored and then other colored people said you know you can't do that or other black people what they are saying what what i'm hearing a lot of them saying is part of the system is that um it it's controlling people's thinking patterns and 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 part of it is a breaking out of a thinking pattern as well as a breaking out of a system now i don't think it's one or the other i think it's it's both you know you can't but I think there's value. There's something of value in what they're saying, and and what they also get dismissed on one side as being part of the right wing, or they get called all sorts of names in America. I mean, I don't. It's difficult for me to understand their voice because I'm not in their context. Um, I don't know what you make okay, of that, or what your thoughts are. I think a lot. No, I think a lot of a lot of those leaders, and and I love the way you like you've done this a lot in our conversation this evening. You keep painting the context. You keep giving context because. I think unless we understand the context of a situation or of a text mm. or of a person, and you don't fully get, you know, why they're saying what they're saying. And, and you're saying these are people who are generally quite successful. Um, maybe they grew up in the projects, but now they've moved to the suburbs and, that, you know, they have a good rapport with, with people in, in, in more affluent communities. And I, I often hear people like that from the American context now. But I've heard this here in South Africa. I've mm. often heard those people, people of color, say, "I'm not buying into this victim mentality thing. I'm not buying into this. Like we, God has given us His Spirit. God has given us the gospel. We, we're not going to buy into this lie that we've been sold and we have and played them. Our eyes are on Jesus. Our eyes are on the things of heaven." Paul said we must be heavenly minded. Uh, and so we're not buying into this worldly mindset. But but again, I think the context has shaped them. You know, like often the further away you get to pain, sadly, I think the context shapes you. It's like when we did hermeneutics, they 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 told us about presuppositions. They said, when you come to a text, beware of what you come to the text with. And then they also said, you will always come to the text with something. Mm. But then mm. somehow I think we forget that. And even when it comes to not just looking at the text, but when, it look, when, we, when we think of our, our world, our social context, somehow we forget to do good hermeneutics, yeah. you know, exegeting our world, also exegeting ourselves, recognizing why we think the way we do, you know why we are where we are in our in our journey and and yeah i think my my thought on this and people might not like it but i think often as is always the case their context has shaped their thinking mm. and because they are so far removed from from that pain they mm. they are no longer able to to think that way nobody's mm. saying you must play the victim yeah. but i keep going hey i'm not playing the victim man I am the victim. Like you want to talk about police brutality and whatever. I was six years old and I had a park ranger, a white park ranger, pull a gun on my father in front of me because he suspected him for being mm. a crayfish poacher. You know, like I've I've seen that harsh treatment. Like mm. I'm not playing the victim. That, you know, and I'm not stuck there, but that is my reality. That's and that the is reality. the reality for so many other people. Yeah. And I don't think we can ignore context and our context shapes our, our thinking. Mm. And I don't think God wants us to ignore our context. I mean, that's the beauty of diversity. Like we can have this conversation having been shaped very differently, but having found commonality in the blood of Jesus, the cross, the gospel, yeah. the kingdom. That's the beauty of it. You don't throw your context yeah. out. So could it, I mean, w- w- in regards to that, because I'm always trying to see if there's something you know, valuable that you can take out of these sorts of conversations, because otherwise, you know, we do, like we said before, we put ourselves in camps and we close ourselves off to conversations because yeah, yeah. I'm only going to now have conversations with people who think this way or that way. Or, um, yeah, yeah. so the thing that I've tried to 
understand and take from them. And, and I, and you framed it very nicely because you were framing it in the context of very sort of Christian language, um, you know, from people who are saying, you know, we Christ minded, we, you know, we're above this because of we're, we're in Christ, that kind of language. And, and the people I was thinking of were a lot more political in America, but I don't know, yeah, some yeah, of them yeah. might be Christians, yeah. but, but, the one thing, so in but the it's context, the same, it's, it's the same, same. It's a very similar rhetoric. Um, yeah, I mean, I I haven't engaged with that so much from an American perspective. I've seen that more in South African context. What what you what yeah, you yeah, yeah, are yeah, talking? Yeah, yeah. So, is there a, is there can it be both? Can it be both things at the same time? Um, can it be that there is a system which is oppressive to people based on race? And that's a reality in the world that's playing out in a number of different levels. And we, yep. as the church and as believers, need to be a voice, a prophetic voice against that system and whatever other way we can fight that system. Um, you know, th th we could talk about that. I mean, there's many ways that we can be engaging in this pro proactively. But at the same time, can we also be proclaiming a message which says something that those who are caught in that system that don't let your thinking be controlled by the system, because that's part of what the system wants to do. And, and I, and I was thinking, I was hearing someone say this, I can't remember who this was. Uh, um, and you know, they, they used this example where they were getting ahead and, 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 and someone in their community um, said to them, you know, uh, well, a bunch of guys said to them, oh, you better be keeping it real but they were sort of, you know, going to school a lot and studying a lot. And, and the, the, the kind of language was like, that's not who we are. And, and I don't know, I don't know his experience, but it's like, that's part of, isn't that part of the, the, the issue that, that there's been this idea that like you're saying, the system isn't just been an, a system which oppresses from the outside, but it's been specific, specifically designed to infiltrate the minds of people and to, to make people think that that's the way it should be. Um, and I've yeah. heard that kind of language in South Africa. I've heard language like that, you know, um, f from, you know, uh, from people, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of a conversation I had on Twitter with when I didn't, was in a conversation. I was watching a conversation where yeah. based on the, the current track record of the ANC, and that's another just debate on its own, but they were basically, this was a black person who was saying, you know, you know, black people shouldn't, be in government basically that was their conclusion to it and i was like well isn't that part of the problem that we put people in these you know that there's a system that says you're good for this thing you know jeremy you you come from you know you've mentioned all your heritage you've got all this different heritage you're probably good at music and you you got a lot of rhythm and maybe i because i'm white i'm good at maths but actually i suck at it but we put the part of this construct has been to put people into camps and it is a mental yeah. it is a it is an assault on yeah, yeah. how we see ourselves and see each other and people based on that and shouldn't we be fighting both these things at the same time yeah no you totally and and that's why i mean Again, I'm with you. Jesus, Jesus is the answer. <laughs> okay, we'll end it. That's Jesus, it. We'll end there. <laughs> because Jesus is going to transform our mind. Being sanctified by the Spirit and being discipled by other disciples, we become more like Jesus. We begin to think more like God and our lives align more with the Word. And then it spills over from our personal lives. We are personally transformed into society. I mean, it's, that's it. I, I mean, easier said than done, but... No. And that might sound trite, but that is it. And that's the biggest challenge because, and it is something we need to be fighting on both levels. Uh, 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 started working through this book. Um, and in the book, they were talking about systems and powers. But they were talking about the, the, the Greek word for uh, powers, like where Paul talks about, Ephesians 6, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And and the Greek word for powers, I think it's exousia. Yeah. It's it's a it's a pretty colorless term. It could mean evil demon spirits. It could mean governing authorities that mm. rule over cities and towns and nations. In fact, sometimes it's translated one way, sometimes the other. And and Paul says we don't wrestle against people we wrestling we wrestling against this so oh. uh, is demon spirits and strongholds 
uh, yes, is it evil powers that dominate thinking and ideologies and systems? Yes, it's both, you know, and, and the more we engage the gospel, the more we're going to find that. Maybe on a personal level, there's a spirit in someone that needs to be caught. On a societal level, there's some other evil power mm. that needs to be that needs to be cast out. Yeah. Right? Um, but but I, I also, I mean, you said earlier, um, like before you saying those that are stuck in the system, you know, their minds are infiltrated and, and, um, I don't want to assume who you meant by those, uh, but I'm hoping you meant all of Every, us. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, exactly. It, I it some, goes you both know, ways. It's easy to go, yeah, but the, the people in the townships who are stuck in the system, mm. like, would help them get free. And no. so I, I was reading some, uh, oh, can I say, black theology. Just, okay. Liberation but, theology. But what I... The, well, specifically black theology, and, and I haven't read a lot, but the little guys that, and this is not often mentioned because there are so many caricatures, but one of the premises of black theology is it, it, it's not just helping black people to find freedom, black as in, in our context, people of color, right? It's not just, help, it's not just to help them find freedom Sorry, hey, I lost you, man. Sorry, man. I, my, I, uh, my phone died, and so oh, I lost no. my connection. It's about to say it's not just about you know those people, but it's also about freedom for. And I was assuming you're going to talk yeah. to about us white yeah. people. So I don't know if you want to carry. Uh, you you went for a while there, but I think we lost so, you. <laughs> so just simply stated, I mean, those who have power in an unequal society, that power is also bondage. Mm. That power is also mm. slavery. Because you become a slave to your mm. power, a slave to your materialism, a slave to your privilege, a slave to whatever. And so a theology like black theology, which is really a theology of suffering, it, it, it says, no, God wants all people to be free, both the oppressed and the oppressor, both those that are above and beneath. So all, all that to say, I think any theology, just taking it away from black theology, any theology should really be a theology of freedom that says mm. God wants all people to be liberated, right? Mm. And we know that true liberation is found in Jesus. But even for all people who are made in God's image, they should be able to experience the freedom that we can offer them uh, through the gospel. And that should affect all areas of life, yeah, irrespective absolutely. of whether you're at the top or at the bottom, whether you're in power or not, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I agree with you. It's both. It's a personal mental thing, but it's also a societal, structural, systemic thing. I think, sure, what you're saying now is so powerful because, and I, and I think if we do have a future conversation, I want to talk about, you know, how do we actually approach this from a Christian perspective and what do, what are the answers that we offer, which we've simplistically said is Christ. And it's not simplistic because I mean, it, it really is the answer, but it's, I think we need to unpack that quite a bit because it's, you know, people will think what we're saying is just, you know, give people a, a, a particular brand of theology or something. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the way I see what you're saying for me, that really hits home to me and has been, I think for me, the biggest driving force in terms of my own journey with this coming out of my own um, background as being white and growing up white and growing up privileged and, and growing up. Um, separated you know as a kid we were separated but I'm, I'm young enough that we were starting to be integrated but there was still reality is there was still a lot of um, separation um, between races but I think the thing that has been the greatest blessing and the greatest driving force for me and it is exactly that is that the freedom that comes from I mean besides economic there's economic realities there's there's a whole bunch of realities, but the biggest thing is the freedom that comes is the freedom to relate to other people. And we, we, we lose so much of God's counsel and God's plan and God's purpose for this world. If there's a certain segment of society that I just don't relate to because of whatever. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. might not be yeah. that I, you know, I hate them or I, or I, or I despise them or anything, but I just, just, I just keep away from them. You know, I just keep to my side and they keep to their side. And 
I mean, if we think of it, what is the, what is it that we are going to have? If we think of heaven, what is it that we're going to have in heaven? Okay. There's going to be a creation and there's going to be many things, but we essentially going to have God and each other. So, so our, yeah. the biggest blessing we have is the relationship that we can enjoy between each other. But if I have a mindset that is still uh, in influenced and is still influenced by, by, by systemic racist, um, ideologies and thinking patterns and things if that mindset is controlling me what it's what it's actually robbing from me is the opportunity to share life with p- other people that yeah. are a wealth to me um so i've been and, and i mean like i say it's been a driving force but i think you know there's been relationships like that that have proven that to me time and again and and proven to me how much more I gain actually from people who are different to me than, than people who are exactly like me. Um, but it's still a constant, I think it's a constant process that we're in of, of the renewing of our minds and of, of thinking yeah. differently. Um, but that, that really I, just resonates with me. No, hundred percent. I, you know, I think a lot of it, and I mean, I don't want to go too far here because, I'm sure you've got a limit on the time. But I don't know. I, I it do seems like we, it's going. So I think they've, they've, oh, not, they've okay. not limited me. I, I do think that, um, and this might be a bigger conversation, maybe a separate conversation, but a lot of this has got to do with the theology that we inherit. You know, just like uh, the sociology we inherit. So like racism as a social construct that comes from a particular part of the world at a particular time. We have to admit that a lot of Christian theology over the last 200, 300 years, you know, particularly Protestant theology, I mean, it comes from that same part of the world. Mm. So again, it context shapes how we think. I mean, somebody said this recently and it really resonated with me. They said all theology is contextual. Even if you're mm. talking about systematic mm. theology. I think systematics is actually come? the most susceptible to contextualization, actually. Sorry, butting in. I'm not a big fan of systematics. No, exactly. Like, no, like who's writing the textbook? Like who's, and, and I think because we've been so heavily influenced by one particular type of theology, systematic theology, and we've neglected other forms. I know you particularly, uh, just in your own life and in your ministry, you are a proponent of biblical theology. Mm. If, if we don't begin to move beyond pure systematics, you know, then it's easy to call someone a leftist or a mm. rightist and, oh, you this and that, because you're not fitting my neat bow, my little themes, you know. But when we start thinking about biblical theology, we begin to see this overarching story of mm. God and it becomes, it's still possible to read it from your context, but it becomes a little bit harder, you know, because mm. you're going to have to see this overarching sweep of the story of God. And then, you know, the story of God in all humanity, mm. you know, so we're not just looking at the doctrine of the church and the saved and the redeemed and the atoning sacrifice and theories of the atonement. Now we're talking Imago Day. Now we're talking Missio Day and all these bigger themes and, and, and I mean, I have not been in my Christian walk and in my discipleship, I, I have not been overly exposed to the doctrine of Imago Day, for example. Mm. Like, I think we spoke about this before, you know, and so it becomes very easy to kind of forget that people who are not redeemed by Jesus are not really in his image. You know, it's, it's easy mm. to get that they mm. are in their image. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and when you're there, you know, then it's not, you're not far from just doing what, uh, yeah. what, what is being done to black people yeah. in America at the moment and what's been done to, to people in Africa and in South Africa for, for centuries. Yeah. So I think things That's, like biblical theology, things like contextual theology, practical theology beyond just preaching sermons and doing counseling, but just understanding these other forms of theology, I think, I think that's that's what we need uh, as Christian leaders at at the moment. Yeah. Sorry, I'm that's, no, that's Christian leaders now. That's pr- yeah. brilliant. I think what we must do is we must have a future conversation or conversations about these things, um, and and I think it speaks into the whole thing of what is the solution because I think our theology is a huge part of how we're going to see the solution. I mean, yeah. the the argument is out on whether biblical theology comes first or, or exegetical theology, and then you build your other theologies. 
I am a big proponent that actually biblical theology comes first because we meet Jesus first. So even if I meet theology first, the thing that converts the thing, the person that converts my life is Jesus. So, so I immediately approach the Bible when I open it with Jesus being my lens. I just don't know how to do that consistently. And when we learn biblical theology, yeah. we learn to do that consistently. And then I think we can form a better exegetical theology and then all the others that come out of that. But it's interesting what you say, because, um, you know, it's one of the things I actually specifically included when we did God's story is right at the beginning, I make the point that when the fall happens, we don't, I, I always, for many years, I held this belief that mankind lost the image of God. You know, the image yeah. of God was lost in man because of the fall. I have a total not, depravity, my brother. Total yeah, it's, depravity. it's nowhere in the text. And, and the very first encounter we get after the fall of man is we have this murderer, brother-hating murderer, who's angry with God. But God isn't like on the other side of the yeah. universe and this dude's over here. God's yeah. engaging with this guy. God's trying to yeah. lure him and win him back. And, and, um, yeah. and God cares about him. He's just killed his brother, yeah. but God cares about him. I mean, exactly. so I think there is so much damage that has been done by bad systematic theology, which we've also yeah. inherited. We've been taught that, yep. some of it. Yep. Um, and I'm not yep. judging any of my lecturers. They were all fantastic people, but it was part of a system. No, just that you want to use. Yeah. yeah. But I think, that's a, I think that's another conversation we need to have among many others. Uh, it's a big one. Uh, it's a big yeah. So we should do this every week, Jeremy. Oh my word. No, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would be way too much, but I, I generally do think it'd be great if we can do this a, a few more times because I think it helps oh, me as well. Uh, but just as you keep talking these things through, they, they begin to yeah. give you perspective and, and yeah. And particularly talking with, again, we're not colorblind yet, talking to people who are, we don't come from the same world. We don't come from the same background. We have the same, we have the same goal in mind mm. and, and our eyes are on Jesus, but we don't come from the same world. And I think that's, mm. that makes for an even more beautiful conversation and, and we sharpen and shape each other. Yeah, no, totally. I, I think, I mean, I think you've always, in the conversations I've had with you, I've always found that that's where, for me, why I, I, you're like a go-to for me because I can, we, we think on, on similar level, we think in a similar way, but you're coming from a different perspective. So you're always going to, you're always going to shine the light on my blind spot. You're always going to, you know, probe in those areas and things. And I think that's part of, like we're saying, if we just put ourselves in camps, we're never going to have a clear conversation yeah, about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. We're just talking to people who are like us. Yeah. Huge thank you to Jeremy for agreeing to have this conversation with me. And as you can hear, we will have um, additional parts to it. Thank you for everyone. We sort of carried on chatting, so I'm just cutting it off there. We didn't do a formal goodbye to you guys. So thank you for everyone who's joined in. If you like this video, um, please hit the like button or this podcast, share it um, with others who might be able to benefit from it. See you guys next time.